University of London, a premier world center for the study of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. He is the author of the acclaimed book, Cuba, A Revolution in Motion, and is currently finishing another book, Manuscript, Africa's Children, Cuba, The War in Angola, and the End of Apartheid. Dr. I'm sure uh, and Dr. Jeffers will explore it in much greater detail, but Pan-Africanism is the idea that peoples of African descent have a common interest and should be unified in that struggle. And part of it is that it emerges out of the, a number of historical processes. Primarily on that is the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, and neocolonialism, which have forged a common African experience and identity for Africans in Africa and those of African descent outside of Africa. Pan-Africanism, Pan which can have various interpretations and there are various versions of Pan-Africanism, but at the basis, it seeks, as I said before, unity among people of African descent. And one of the important thing that stands out is that um, some of the key ideas and movers and shakers originated in the African diaspora, are particularly in the Caribbean, with activists, for example, I'm going to talk about a very important figure who's tied to that, obviously, Henry Sylvester Williams playing a lead role. So in this first image here, I have a number of um, different images. You see Malcolm X, uh, you see Dr. Bernie Rocky Jones, and you see a number of figures up there like Patrice Kamumba, Martha Garvey, and some key figures, all of them being very important in the black liberation struggle, who all believe that there was some common element that bound all people of African descent together. So I'm going to give sort of like a historical development of the idea of Pan-Africanism. Now, normally we sort of talk about formal Pan-Africanism, normally beginning in the 19th, um, in the 19th century with certain thinkers. But I want to talk about Pan-Africanism, the, the degradation and subjugation of Africans, and also, of course, the, fa the fact that so much money and wealth and the very foundations of uh, the Western world were built on the backs of enslaved Africans. But what's also important is Africans waged a constant war, a constant struggle for their liberation. And I think that's often forgotten. And so I see as some of the precursors of Pan-Africanism, those who were involved in the um, anti-slavery revolts. So we have at the top there is a monument to, um, in, in Barbados to the enslaved African breaking his chains of bondage. Uh, to the left is a, 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 a statue honoring um, Coffee, who led a rebellion in British Guiana. And down there is the famous uh, Negro Maroon uh, from, from, uh, from Haiti acknowledging the role of the enslaved African in calling people to rebellion. And the point about saying this is they may not have consciously articulated a Pan-African view, but one of the important points to bear in mind is quite often uh, plantation owners and the slave traders, uh, particularly, especially when they were landing in the Caribbean and selling people to the plantations, uh, and this is recorded, tried to mix people from different nations, different ethnicities, and different language groups, so that this would act as a barrier to unity and liberation struggles. The number of actual slave revolts that took place uh, which was, a, as I said, a constant um, that, took, uh, that happened. But not only slavery, but the resistance on the slave ships themselves coming across. Uh, for example, in some cases, it's, it's estimated that one in ten, uh, for example, French ships had a slave rebellion on it. And there's all of this sort of discussion that goes on. The fact that these rebellions took place across language, across these barriers, demonstrates the fact that this common interest, this common cause forged I mean, the oppression of slavery was, uh, was beginning to forge this sort of common identity and this common struggle. And I, I can elaborate on that later, but I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, some key figures, this is Matando, the point from Haiti. Matando led a struggle in the 1750s uh, in Haiti against the French for seven years. And he eventually was captured and burnt alive. But when he, when he was being burnt alive, he said, I will return as millions, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you see the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Louverture. It's important to, to look at Toussaint Louverture. I think it's critically important because when we talk about the 19th century revolution, people talk about the, you know, the American Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which did not ex extend to the indigenous peoples, did not extend to Africans, and definitely didn't extend to women, and didn't extend to people who didn't have property. And we talk about the French Revolution of 1789. But the revolution that basically um, expanded the envelope of human rights was the Haitian Revolution, uh, which is not often acknowledged for its contribution to human rights, and how Toussaint Louverture himself um, also aided the Latin American struggles. So in a sense, he is also a precursor of Pan-African for at least in activity and practice. And of course, we have Nani de Maroon. I'm just using some examples here. And Nani is very, very important. In the, in the historic literature on the Maroons, people often make a distinction between uh, revolutionary Maroons and other form of Maroon activities. At some points in Maroon history, as they carried on the struggle, particularly in Jamaica, against British domination, some Maroons came to an agreement. 
I made concessions in, a, in an acknowledgement of their independence by the British. Some of them agreed to return Africans who had escaped from the plantations, return them back to the British. Nanny rejected that. And they rejected the idea that, basically speaking, she would not, for the independence of her own people and for her own, her own interests, sell out the interests of her other African brothers and sisters, right? So she's often seen as an uncompromising maroon. And this sort of idea that there's a fundamental unity that binds up, up people of African up descent together. So these are just some focus in terms of practice. We could go into more detail. I'm going to, I'm going to this rather quickly, I know. And of course, one person I want to highlight from Nova Scotia is Thomas Peters, and of course, uh, the Sierra Leone migration. Thomas Peters uh, was an uncompromising individual when it came to his principles. He is the man who tramped who tra who tra tra through New Brunswick and through Nova Scotia, unite them um, going to different black loyalist communities, and, and they're talking about the wrongs that had been done, and then they respected him so much, they chose him to be their representative who traveled to England to raise their concerns there. He left. Okay, um, came back uh, and he raised money for him. Came back and then he helped was a major organizer of this huge Back to Africa movement uh, that happened on January 15, 1792, when, he left, when 1196 black loyalists left. And Thomas Peters, when he went to Sierra Leone, often is described as dying in disgrace. But what he was, was he was an uncompromising believer in black government, that black people should run their own affairs. And that uh, contributed to a lot of his problems he had in Sierra Leone, in Sierra Leone while he challenged the governor then, who was the, um, um, the, um, the British um, uh, appointed governor, who, who was John Clarkson. And so he represents that kind of unprincipled uh, uh, idea of Pan-Africanism, which at, at the center is the concept of self-determination. And so he's one of these important figures. I would say that is a precursor. You would not have probably have articulated it in the ways we articulate Pan-Africanism, but this very practice, I think, uh, demonstrates that at the core is a very fundamental Pan-African ideas. And so I want you to basically uh, uh, pay some homage to Thomas Peters. He's, that's a rendering of up, up there. Uh, that's a contemporary painting from our time showing the black loyalists who were coming to Halifax, whole families, about 540 families left. And of course, that's a famous uh, painting of the ships in um, laying off free, free town in Sierra Leone. Now, when we come to the 19th century, there's a number of figures we focus on who sort of develop these ideas. And I'm going to go very quickly. So we start with Martin Delaney, who was an African involved uh, in the uh, abolition movement. And he's a person who believed that black people not only should unify, but they could not achieve justice among whites or within a white-controlled society. And they should separate as a nation, right? So that's Martin Delaney, 19th century. You have another figure, Edward Bryden, often referred to as the father of, of Pan-Africanism in many people's eyes, uh, born in the Caribbean, and he is a person who actually believed that Africans, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going very quickly here, but who believed that Africans should return to Africa, and that's where they could only specifically achieve um, the kind of uh, justice, right, and kind of self-determination. You know. So these are key figures historically in developing this idea that peoples of African descent have a common interest and should unify. A central figure here, for our purposes, is Henry Sylvester Williams. And Henry Sylvester Williams, uh, um, who lived from 1869 to 1911, was a teacher from Trinidad and Tobago, well, from Trinidad, studied law at Dalhousie University uh, before leaving for England, where he was called to the bar in 1902. And when Williams entered Dalhousie Law School in 1893 as its first black student, and in fact, where he went, where he would have gone, would have been down close to the Grand Parade Square. I was just down there for George Eliot Clark's reading. That's where Dalhousie for a long period of time was located. So he would have gone there. It's interesting that since he was going to the, um, Dalhousie University, and Chike and I have talked about this quite often, Dr. Jefferson and I have talked about this quite often, it's without a doubt he would have interacted with James Robinson Johnson, the only other person of African descent attending Dalhousie at that time. Johnson was the first African um, of Nova Scotia, we all know, to graduate from university with a BA in 1896 and a law degree in 1898. In England, he left, uh, Williams left England and went on to organize, uh, le le left for England and went on to organize the first Pan-African, first African Association in 1897 and the first ever Pan-African Congress in 1900. And so this is in here, he uh, this is a newspaper clipping, this is the church he worshiped with in Halifax. And I won't spend much time, but what's interesting is he also was very active in the community here. William was, um, uh, perhaps played a role in founding the, um, the Colored Hockey League. He was, um, you know, he was at this church here, which I had just shown you. Uh, one of the pastor, the, the pastor Henry B. Brown, who was in Halifax um, from Jamaica, right in Halifax from Jamaica, the same year as Williams did. 
He also attended the Pan-African Congress that Williams organized in 1900. So in a sense, Henry Sylvester Williams can be seen as the father of organized political Pan-Africanism. Um, the Pan-African Congress that he organized in London in 1900 was a breakthrough event bringing together black activists from Britain, the United States, the Caribbean, and Africa, along with white supporters. Follow Following in, William, in Williams' footsteps was W. Du Bois. I think he cannot, um, in fact, he's considered sometimes as the towering figure in Pan-African thought. Um, he's famous, for example, for the, identifying that the problem of the 20th century, and dare I say the problem of the 21st century, and hopefully not beyond it, is the problem of the color line. Mm -hmm. And so Du Bois, uh, which uh, Dr. Jeffers is one of the preeminent experts internationally, was a central figure. And following in uh, Williams' footsteps, uh, as he organized and convened a series of Pan-African Congress from 1919 to 1945. These gatherings were held with the goal of unifying Africans and advocating for more rights and political freedoms for Africans. Then, now, in, uh, this is, um, he wrote a piece coming out of the, um, the First World War. It's, I think it's apt to sort of highlight this, because we're coming up to the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And, Du Bois wrote a very important article called The African Roots of War, that arguing, and I think very persuasively, that the struggle for, for, among European powers to have a bigger part of the colonial plan, particularly of the magnificent, magnificent African kick, was one of the central causes of World War I. And you can see the article is, uh, uh, was republished here in April of 73 in a very prestigious uh, left-wing journal, academic journal called um, Mon The Monthly Review and the African Roots of War. So he wanted one of the key thinkers along some of these issues. This is from um, the Pan-African uh, Pan Africanist Congress that was held in, in Paris after the Versailles Congress. This is the one from the Pan-Africanist Congress of Brussels, 1921. Uh, all sorts of petitions and demands uh, for African self-determination were issued coming out of these congresses. But particularly, and of course, it's important to understand that Pan-Africanism becomes wedded, in some cases, or some, a very strong version of Pan-Africanism becomes wedded with radical socialist thought, particularly with the, um, the movement coming out of the Soviet Union. And so, for example, one cannot talk about Pan-Africanism in the 20s and the 30s if we don't talk about the impact of the, of, the, of the Russian Revolution. I can expand on that later. This is a picture from the Congress of the Peoples of the, of, of the East in 1920, an attempt to bring people together from all the colonial countries. Okay? It's sort of misnamed the Congress of the Peoples of the East, but to bring all the colonial peoples together um, to actually struggle against um, European control. Um, an important event that also takes place, and I, just, I messed this up, but I'll leave that aside and move on, okay? But the 1945 Pan-African Congress was, extremely, um, was particularly significant as it produced a manifesto demanding that Africa be free of any external domination. And some of those who attended that 1945 Congress held in Manchester, England, were Kwame Nkrumah, who becomes a central figure after the Second World War in articulating and keeping the idea of Pan-Africanism alive, and people like Yomo Kenyatta become central figures and so on. Uh, uh, Marcus Garvey is a key figure. I'm going to come back to him later on if I have enough time. This is the plaque to the Pan-African Congress in Manchester, England. Uh, Dr. Hakim Adi, who was a guest here at Dalhousie a few years ago, is one of the preeminent scholars on these Pan-African Congresses. Here's a picture from Manchester of it, and you see some of the key uh, people uh, who played important roles in the African anti-colonial struggle being there as well. Um, one of the key events, I'll jump over this, was basically the invasion of Ethiopia. Uh, by Italy in 1935, and this becomes a very important moment to unify people of African descent, both inside Africa and outside Africa. Um, and the idea that Ethiopia, the last African independent country, <coughs> leave Liberia and, and, and Sierra Leone aside, they were kind of protectorates, right? But uh, Ethiopia was the last truly independent African nation, and the attack by Italy and the fact that the Western powers did nothing galvanized people. And in fact, some historians say, the, the, the African anti-colonial struggle would have, is probably dated to 1935, but that's another debate, discussion. Okay? The key figures like C.L.R. James are figures who emerge out of this, and his famous book, The Black Jacobins, right? These are some key thinkers, right? Uh, he brings, he represents a particular kind of Pan-Africanism, a particular trend of it, uh, particularly focusing on class struggle. Uh, Amy Cesar, um, when, um, when jo George Eliot Clark today spoke about, this is very important, he spoke about in a poem he read, a very powerful poem he read about Dalhousie, and he spoke about uh, uh, World War II, about the violence of World War II, the genocide, uh, the imperial crimes, and he spoke about those being, of those being 
forms of oppression, forms of barbarity being imported into Europe that had actually been carried out in the colonies, right? Particularly in Africa, he was basically drawing on a very important um, point uh, that Aimé César had made tremendously eloquently. And Aimé César appearing from the French Caribbean. George Padmore, a very important person from Trinidad and Tobago, who was very much involved in the communist movement, then broke with the communist movement, but uh, also worked very closely with Kwame Nkrumah, uh, lived, uh, from Trinidad to lived in Ghana, a very important figure in articulating the idea of Pan-Africanism. Uh, we have uh, here Harry Haywood. Harry Haywood was a member of the Communist Party, Party remained an uncompromising communist until, uh, until his death. And he is one of the persons who articulated the idea of a black nation, right, that Garvey had spoken about. He did a lot of analysis that at one point in, in the U.S., in the U.S. South, there was a black nation that existed and that it should have self-determination. Uh, this is a book, Pan-Africanism, Communism by Hakim Ali. I encourage everybody to read it. It's very dense, very big, but I think it's authoritative and definitive. Uh, Franz Fanon. Many people grew up in the 1960s reading The Wretched of the Good, Black Skin's White Mass, right? Fanon's attempt to understand the psychological and cultural and psychic impact of colonization on those who had been colonized, right? And I think Fanon falls within that category of articulating a very deep analysis of Pan-Africanism. And he was in trouble. Of course, Nkrumah becomes extremely important. Uh, Nkrumah obviously uh, leads Ghana to independence in 1957, and he becomes committed to this idea of African unity. At one point he says, Ghana's independence means nothing without the independence of Africa. And at various conferences he articulated the need, not only to end colonialism in Africa, which is still an ongoing struggle, but for Africans to unite. And so we have Nkrumah, uh, he wrote a book, Neocolism, The Last Age of Imperialism, Africa was, it must unite. He actually organized a conference in 1962, if I remember correctly, uh, All African People's Conference, this idea of focusing on African unity, right? And so Nkrumah becomes one of the major persons to articulate this idea in the, in the modern world, if I may say so, in the 20th century of African unity. I encourage everybody to read his work. When he's overthrown, he still remains a symbol of an African independence. And in fact, at one point, the idea of unifying uh, Guinea and, and Ghana was an idea that he and Sekou Touré uh, both mooted and attempted to bring about, right? This idea that Africans must be in control of their own house. And I, it's in kind of interesting because that's kind of really has a tremendous uh, impact today when we read about the fact that the headquarters of the African Union in Addis Ababa, which was constructed by a foreign power, apparently has been bugged. Right, and, it's, and what happens is every day the server downloads and sends it right uh, outside of Africa. Right, so somebody said, "Well, you know," and this was the head of um, the African Union, the current president, which is Kagame. He said, "Well, perhaps Africa shouldn't have its headquarters built by a foreign power." But that's another point. So, Nkrumah was was about that issue of African independence. I don't have Lumumba up here, Patrice Lumumba. I encourage everybody to read Patrice Lumumba's last book, almost, almost over. Oh, you yeah. So Patrice Lumumba, um, who was, um, and I encourage everybody to read about Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. Uh, he um, you know, leads Congo to independence. I mean, of course, the Belgians were sabotaging Congo's independence. And he attempts to not only establish the conditions, right? by which the Congolese, or at least a particular side of the Congolese should control their resources for their own development. But he also talks about African unity. And he writes this incredibly beautiful letter, and if I had time I'd read it to you, that you know, the US organizes, together with the Belgians, his assassination, you know, he's tortured, he's, a, he's shot, his body is chopped up and then dissolved in acid, right? And as, after he's been tortured, but before he's killed, he writes this incredible letter to his wife, that can only bring tears to your eyes, right? And he was one of the people who talked about African unity and African independence and paid the price. Walter Rodney, How Europe Under Developed Africa, a whole bunch of his works. We're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the Walter Rodney riots in Jamaica. Rodney's teaching about not only African history and pride in being black, but also his understanding that workers and ordinary people were the, uh, mot were the motive force of history was such a threat in 1968 to the Jamaican government that when he left, this towering scholar, that when he left, they, they basically banned him from coming back, right? He actually, and what happens is that leads to the Rodney riots. He eventually goes off, teaches in Tanzania, returns to Ghana, is assassinated. And his book, Among, among Many, How Europe and Developed, uh, Developed Africa, is a very important intellectual contribution to Pan-Africanism, looking at the relationship of Africa uh, to Europe. We have here uh, a very important example of Pan-Africanism 
in Canada in 1968. We have the formation, we have the uh, Congress of Black Writers that's supposed to advertising it there. We have people like Stokely Carmichael who come and, and basically speak at this meeting. Walter Rodney is there. Um, uh, Dr. Burnley Rocky Jones is also participates in that meeting. The book that focuses a lot on this uh, the award-winning book that focuses a lot on this Congress, Fear of a Black Nation, Race, Sex, and Politics in 1960s Montreal by David Austin. The pictures that he uses from this Congress actually comes from, um, from Rocky's personal connection, collection. And so what this Congress was, it was the largest gathering of black activists um, in the Americas, right, in the so-called world outside of Africa at that time, bringing together them to talk about the condition of black people in um, the Western world, right, and organizing for their liberation. And Stokely Carmichael, who visited Halifax, after that Congress was a major person. The picture below there, this picture here, is actually a picture um, of the students organizing at uh, Sir George Williams University, now folded into Concordia, which was an important uh, and leading to the Sir George Williams incident, right? Which, uh, shall we say, uh, put paid to the belief that black people were happy and content in Canada, and Canada was free of racism. 19, that event in 1969 is very important, and some people who participated in the Congress, uh, or writers in 68 participated in that. Uh, and I'd also like to say that we have Fidel Castro, who was considered by Stokely Carmichael to be a Pan-Africanist. So it's interesting that you can even have white people based on their politics being considered Pan-African, and there you see Mand uh, Mandela with Fidel Castro. And I want to end by looking at Nova Scotia again, coming back to Cape Breton, right? And so in Cape Breton, you know, we have the, uh, Marcus Garvey, and I mentioned Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey is a very important Pan-African figure because he was the leader of the largest mass movement of black people in history. The, 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 the size of the movement in terms of its estimations vary, right? But the United, he formed the United Negro Improvement Association, which, whose goal was the promotion of social, political, economic freedom by uniting, quote, all people of African ancestry of the world to one great body to establish a, a country and an absolute government of their own. One particular strand of Pan-Africanism, perhaps you might call the hard fundamental strand of Pan-Africanism. The influence of the movement led by Garvey was felt across the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, and throughout Africa. Promotion of social, political, and economic freedom for those of African descent was central uh, to this movement. He called for a separate state, uh, black, uh, separate state for black people in the United States. At its peak, the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association, had 500 chapters in 22 countries: North America, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean were the regions where it was represented. Some people estimate that 750 members and supporters um, um, ex were officially members of the organization and that more than 1,000 people were employed. And the UNI network, the United Negro Improvement Association network, connected people across the world. And many black nationalist organizations, like the Nation of Islam, we can talk, and other people like Malcolm X, the Black Panther Party, drew inspiration in the 60s from what we call Garveyism. In Canada alone, there were 32 chapters, okay? And the most active um, branches were in places where you had recent Caribbean immigrants. But you had active chapters in Nova Scotia, I'll talk about in a bit. In 1921, an estimated 1,200 immigrants existed, uh, lived in Toronto, around Dundas Street and Spadina <coughs> Avenue. The most, and they set up UNIA chapters. The most active chapters were in Montreal, Toronto, Windsor, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, and Hamilton, that's in the Ontario region. 5,000, uh, people of African descent joined uh, Marcus Garvey's movement, okay? And the Toronto branch, which was the most active, operated, which was formed in 1918, operated until 1982. In 1920, Garvey visited and spoke in Toronto, and the movement ended up buying a building on College Street, which became an important meeting place for the black community. Um, the UNIA organized community activities and cultural events, and one person, uh, Marjorie uh, Lewensi, who was a, uh, was a participant in the Garvey movement, she said, we, we all used to meet at the hall. Every week, there were speakers, programs, and dances. That's how active that movement was. The Toronto UNIA uh, um, uh, organized an annual Emancipation Day picnic held at Lakeside Park near St. Catharines, right? And at a peak in 1924, it had 8,000 visitors. In 1967, it had an, another major one, uh, uh, sort of as a counter for the 150th anniversary. Right? So we have a number of these different things that take place. But in 1920, he visited Nova Scotia. Okay, and Garvey was a proponent of, as I said, of, as he was a proponent of black nationalism. And what we have here in 1921 is a demonstration, a picture. This is taken from the uh, the Beacon Institute. This is Laurier Street, Whitney Pier, 
very famous picture, black nationalist banners, uh, banners and black advocate, Africa for Africans, right? So here is a demonstration taking place in Whitney Pier, Sydney. The UNA Hall here, this is the picture taken from 2008, still continues there. And one of the things I, I want to draw, which I should mention as well, is that in, 19, um, that in Nova Scotia there were at least 11 branches. And as I said, it's still an active hall in Glace Bay. And on a return visit to Nova Scotia, in October 1937, Garvey spoke in both Halifax and Sydney on the conditions of the black communities in the province. Invited to speak in Sydney by members of the local UNIA branch, Garvey declared that the problem of black empowerment had to be solved by black peoples themselves. And this is a quote from, the, from, the, from his speech. And perhaps many of you already know what I'm alluding to. Quote, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. Mind is your only ruler, sovereign. So people, he says, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. And Bob Marley received later on a collection of Garvey's speeches and read the speech in Nova Scotia and based his song, Redemption Song, on this. The last point I'd like to end on here is when we talk about important um, Pan-Africanists and I want to talk about Dr. Bernie Rocky Jones. And of course, I, I'm remiss by not adding his sister Lynn Jones as well, who should be up here. But Rocky was a central figure um, in articulating not only a fight for Nova Scotia, for African Nova Scotians precisely, but trying to also put it in the context of a struggle for people of African descent. And so here's Rocky. And I mentioned the Congress of, uh, of Black Writers organized in 1968 in Montreal. Let us not forget, we come up to 50 years uh, anniversary of that event. But let us not forget that <coughs> November 30th, 1968, we will be marking 50 years since the formation of the Nova Scotia Black United Front, where over 500 people packed into the North Branch Library that day to articulate black power. I mean, I've been reading testimonies about that. And as one person, Frank Boyd, says in a, uh, in a piece he wrote uh, for Fire on the Water with George L. Clark Ellington, he said, when we sat there, we felt like black power existed, right? So that was another example, I think, of a profound reflection of Pan-Africanism in a Nova Scotian context and in that, Dr. Bernie Rocky Jones played an importantly central role. I encourage everybody to read his autobiography, Bernie Rocky Jones Revolutionary. I didn't agree with Rocky and everything, but for the last two and a half years of our life, we had lots of discussions. And one thing I can attest to is the man's integrity, his commitment to Nova Scotia, his commitment for the struggle for human rights, but also his commitment to Pan-Africanism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. And thank you all for being here. So we're moving now from history to philosophy, from questions of what gave rise to Pan-Africanism, to questions of what, if anything, justifies commitment to Pan-Africanism, here and now. I speak as a committed Pan-Africanist, but as a philosopher, it's also important to me that to hold that position uh, and enc encourage others to hold it, uh, I would only do so on the basis of arguments. Uh, I could only recommend buying into Pan-Africanism, so to speak. If it is possible to subject Pan-Africanism as an idea to critical scrutiny and thoughtful opposition, and then after that, still find it ethically and politically compelling. I am a Pan-Africanist, but should you be one? Or for those who are not black and thus not the target of pleas for black unity, should you be supportive of Pan-Africanism? Might we have good reasons to refuse or even discourage Pan-Africanism, perhaps to view it as something that might have once been useful, but which is now a thing of the past, or maybe even as something that was never worth embracing in the first place. Sometimes if you encourage someone from the diaspora to think in a Pan-Africanist way, you might hear as a response, I am no African, <laughs> and conversely, when encountering 
a person from the diaspora talking in a pan-Africanist way, you might hear someone from the continent say, but you are not African. <laughs> in other words, among many black people, there is skepticism about how much sense it makes to see us as united and as one, and specifically as uni unified in being African. <clears throat> Should we be skeptical in this way? Let us admit right now that when people from the diaspora voice opposition to being seen as African, it is sometimes, at least partly, because they have very negative associations with Africa. They see it as a third, <coughs> impoverished, a war-torn place that they want nothing to do with. Let us also admit that when people from the continent emphasize the distinction between themselves and people of the diaspora, it is sometimes, at least partly, because they have negative associations with those black people descended from slaves, those black people who they might say or at least think lack a genuine culture, worry too much about racism, do too little to chase success and do too many things that result in them being in trouble with the law. Now I would say if you resist Pan-Africanism because you think Africans are dirty savages and you don't want to be a dirty savage, then you are not resisting Pan-Africanism for a good reason. If you resist Pan-Africanism because those black Americans or those West Indians or those black Nova Scotians strike you as dangerous and stagnant cultural orphans, then you are not resisting Pan-Africanism for a good reason. I think we would agree on that. But I would say that there are also better, more reasonable ways of resisting Pan-Africanism. Someone might look at the person from the, di the diaspora claiming not to be African, and the person from the continent claiming that no one from the diaspora should claim to be African, and say, look, whether they see each other in negative, stereotypical ways or not, they have these outlooks on how different they are from each other precisely because, as a matter of somewhat obvious fact, they are different from each other. They come from very different places. They've been shaped by very different cultures. And there's no good reason for erasing or downplaying that difference. As a matter of fact, we, might, we barely understand them, this person might say, by placing them in these large generic categories of continent and diaspora. We better understand them when we recognize that the one is, let's say, from the country of Kenya, and more specifically of Luo ethnicity, while the other is, let's say, a Canadian whose parents come from Barbados but who was born and raised in Toronto. We should be specific in this way, the opponent of Pan-Africanism might say, because black people are very diverse and they ought to be recognized as such. In fact, this opponent might say there isn't really anything that unites these two people other than the fact that, at least here in North America, they both happen to be categorized as black. Now, hold on, you might say. That categorization is pretty important. And this sophisticated, reasonable anti-Pan-Africanist would say, yes, of course. Of course it is important because being categorized as black is how both of these two find themselves targeted by racism. The problem with Pan-Africanism, though, this person would say, is that it makes the same mistake that white racism makes. It treats black people as if we are all alike, as if there are no important differences between us. But that is wrong. We need to fight the legacy of racist thinking by rejecting homogenization, by emphasizing the fact that we are different as individuals and as groups within this larger category of blackness. Now, maybe this person might be so kind as to admit that Pan-Africanism managed to play a productive role historically in helping to propel anti-colonial and anti-racist movements forward in ways just detailed for us by Dr. Singh. Perhaps the anti-Pan-Africanist might look back at something even so recent as the defeat of apartheid in South Africa as a victory that Pan-Africanist solidarity played some part 
in security. And yet, in a post-apartheid world, what is the point in pretending that black unity makes sense? Many would say that we need to be looking forward to the point where we do not see each other as members of races anymore, but rather simply as human beings. Even if that is not a goal worth pursuing at present in our anti-Pan-Africanist's eyes, what our opponent might encourage is that we recognize racism and inequality as problems that vary so widely in nature based on where you are, and thus as problems to be fought through more local forms of solidarity, preferably interracial solidarity, not through attempts to resurrect this old and unrealistic ideal of black unity. That, I would say, is a relatively reasonable form of anti-Pan-Africanism. And yet somehow I remain convinced that Pan-Africanism is relevant to today's world, that it makes sense as a general orientation, and isn't even something like a mere personal preference, but rather more of an imperative that all Africans, continental and diasporic, ought to support. Why? Let me first address the idea that Pan-Africanism could potentially be seen as a thing of the past, something that made sense once upon a time but which has no place in today's world. It seems rather clear to me that conditions in the world today make the question of whether black people ought to unify across ethnic and national boundaries increasingly rather than decreasingly significant and the possibility of answering yes to this question increasingly rather than decreasingly sensible. In the majority white countries of North America and Europe, immigration trends over the last half century have consistently increased the diversity of black populations. Whether the majority of black people in the country are of recent immigrant background, as in European countries, or not, as in the United States, there is no escaping anywhere the reality that the so-called black community in Western countries is drawn from various parts of the black world, making relations between black people of various backgrounds an increasingly important issue. Canada is, of course, a very interesting case, as the large majority of the black population in the country as a whole uh, is of recent immigrant background, making us similar to Europe in that way. Different, not only from the United States, but every other country in the Americas with any sizable black population. Nevertheless, we also have long-standing black populations. And here in Nova Scotia, you find a situation comparable to that of the United States. The majority of the black population in the province being not of recent immigrant background, but rather descended from people who arrived centuries ago. And yet, recent immigration has continuously made the black population here more and more diverse. How could the question of black unity be irrelevant here? Furthermore, while immigration has made the local more global, the global has famously become more local through economic and technological transformations that have greatly reduced the significance of national borders. The future development of majority black countries in Africa and the Americas will not be toward greater and greater independence, but rather greater and greater interdependence. This naturally raises the question of what role unity on the basis of African <coughs> heritage might play in the formation and strengthening of global linkages. To say this is not yet to show that Pan-Africanism is the only way forward, but it does show that never before has Pan-Africanism been so relevant as an option, never so evidently possible as a political and cultural way forward despite the physical distances, linguistic barriers, and all the other things that could be seen as dividing us. So now let me reply to the claim by the anti-Pan-Africanists that to encourage unification is to homogenize, to pretend wrongfully that black people are all the same. This worry especially comes up 
in relation to cultural pan-Africanism, the idea that we should celebrate and seek to perpetuate a sense of common cultural identity among black people across the world. What is black culture? The anti-pan-Africanist asks. How could one believe that such a thing exists? In light of the cultural diversity of single African countries, much less the whole of Africa, and plus the diaspora. And yet people do not tend to have the same reaction to talk of culture in relation to the West. To speak of Western culture is not to say that Italians, New Zealanders, Swedes, and Americans all have the exact same culture. It is rather to group together the cultures of European and European descended peoples. In speaking of black culture, I am similarly grouping together African and African descended cultures without meaning to imply that all are exactly the same. It is also true, though, that the term Western culture connotes greater unity than the notion of an umbrella term may imply, since Western cultures are linked not merely by geography and ancestry, but by a specific social history. This history is traced back, of course, to ancient Greece, which in turn influenced ancient Rome. The latter empire first draws together much of what is now called the West. In the wake of that empire's end, medieval Christendom becomes the next antecedent for modern Europe. Then you have the colonization of the Americas, crucial in defining European identity, as it provides a major step in the construction of a world system in which white Europeans can be set apart from those they rule over as non-white others. By talking about this imperialist system, I have highlighted the most sinister aspect of the development of Western culture. But note that the point would be the same even if I chose to focus on reputed moments of greatness like the Reformation and the Renaissance, the scientific and industrial revolutions, the American and French revolutions, and other such celebrated events, Western culture is much more than a name pulling cultures related only by their presence or their origin on the not quite clearly demarcated <coughs> landmass that is Europe together. Western culture is a story of causes and effects, of historical events and their influence, a story by virtue of which the self-understandings of members of various Western cultures are connected and harmonized enough to produce something like a shared identity and a distinctive way of life, even on this widely dispersed global scale. Is there a story to tell for black culture? Yes, what unifies black identity is not some biological essence, but a particular history a story of global dispersion and a series of recombinations under conditions of slavery and colonial rule. Indeed, to engage with the history of any one part of the black world without reference to other parts is to misunderstand and mystify that part. Black history, especially if we mean by this the modern history of African and African descended peoples, as shaped by European imperialism, is a story of global circulation, the circulation of people, and as a result, the circulation of culture. To see, for example, any black people in the Americas as unconnected to other parts of the black world generally involves, to start with, that prevalent misunderstanding of the history of black culture, the idea that slavery destroyed the cultures of the enslaved leaving their descendants with either no culture at all, the culture of their oppressors, or a distinct but new culture completely unrelated to what came before. Each of those three options is untenable. The idea of black people in slavery and afterward as having no culture is the most obviously wrong of all, as it is based on the anthropologically ridiculous idea that it is possible to lack a culture. <laughs> The idea that the enslaved took on the culture of those who enslaved them is not based on any such confusion about what is anthropologically possible, and it is indeed partially correct. But the special condition of slavery worked to pu both pull Africans into Western culture while simultaneously keeping them separate and culturally distinct. 
Finally, the idea that new cultures were developed in these oppressive situations is again also correct, but goes wrong when this newness is seen as meaning a total lack of connection with the old. All cultures of African peoples in the Americas show the influence of the African cultures brought by those enslaved. But note that culture flows back. Culture flows back from the Americas to Africa. To take the easy example of music, Nigeria's most celebrated musician, Fela Anikulako Kuti, invented the jazz and funk inflected genre he called Afrobeat after a visit to Los Angeles, where a former Black Panther named Sandra Smith raised his consciousness of black politics and African identity. Sukus, the popular music of the Democratic Republic of Congo, is famously based on Afro-Cuban music. Indeed, it is often called African rumba. Kwaito, the popular music of South Africa, is partly a twist on the African-American genre of house music. And of course, everywhere on the continent, hip-hop is huge. Not only hip-hop, though, also, reggae and dance song. Jamaica indeed makes contributions to Pan African culture amazing for its small size. But why don't people recognize this? Why all the skepticism about black culture as a living global organism? Well, I believe this is related to the fact that resisting Pan Africanism is part of perpetuating divisions that are not really natural but rather to a significant extent, products of anti-black racism. As our example of I ain't African or you're not African from before should have showed us, misunderstandings and antagonisms between black people of different backgrounds do not arise out of thin air because of the bare fact of being different, especially when they are brought together in societies full of anti-black stereotyping like here in North America, much of the discord between black groups can plausibly be related to our acceptance of, or at least the failure to challenge, the distorting images of white supremacist ideology. Pan-Africanism's call for unity should be seen as a call not to naturalize an unnatural unity, but to stop naturalizing a sense of division that the ugliness of white supremacy has fostered among us. Once we recognize our place in the epic, painful, and yet also amazingly productive story of blackness, and once we transcend the divisions that anti-black stereotyping encourages among us, then we can return to the question of our diversity with new eyes. Are we diverse? Yes. But that diversity is a strength of our common cultural identity rather than a sign that we have no common identity. We are diverse, beautifully diverse, and we are one at least as much as the West is one. And we black people here in Canada are part of both the Western world and the Pan-African world. My hope is that in the world as a whole, and importantly right here in Nova Scotia, we will celebrate more and more our unity and our diversity, our unity in its diversity, and our diversity within unity. <coughs> to do so is to fight for the dream of a flourishing black community in what is, I believe, the only way that makes sense. Thank you. Well, thank you to our panelists. A lot to think about tonight. A lot to think about tonight. So do we have any questions to open up the discussion? Ifo? Thank you, both of you, for your beautiful presentation. Um, there's so much I could ask, but I'm curious about, um, I am proud of the history that you, share, that you both shared. And I'm looking at when you talked about what was happening with UNI, what's it called, UNIA? UNIA. And the buildings that they own, and so many organizations that were even here in Nova Scotia. And then I think of the fact that there was no internet, no Twitter, none of that stuff. So the question I'm wondering is, what is our excuse today 
for our lack of unity and organizing, even though we have all these tools at our disposal. And I'm wondering if you guys, either of you have any thoughts on that. So did everyone hear Ifo's question? It's pretty articulate or loud. Okay, good. So you all can respond when you're ready. Well, um, I think uh, that's a powerful question. Uh, if we start with United Negro, um, United Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, or UNIA, some people call it, I um, mean, I said there was 750,000. Some people even put it in the millions, right? Of people who might not have been members, but were fellow travelers, right? So it was seen as a, you know, like a very powerful moment when we talk about, um, you, know, uh, you know, when I study this sort of story, you know, we see people being able to organize without the internet. So, and we look at the 60s, right? The powerful movements that existed in the 60s. I, I, I mean, it's a tough question to answer, but I think fundamental, I think one of the important points is that if you look at the United States as an example, for, um, and you know, we even look at the case of Nkrumah, and we look at what's happened. The Western world, the Western, uh, in, you know, in the US, the US government targeted uh, black organizations, right? particularly the Panthers, right? But they targeted also the um, Nation of Islam, and there's a famous counterintelligence surgency program known as COINTELPRO. And their goal was not only to, and it's important, but there's two points. Not only were they aiming at destroying those organizations, it seems they were also aiming in the U.S. at destroying the conditions that led to those organizations. So there's a very famous quote from Duriba Bin Wahid. Uh, Duriba Bin Wahid um, was a member of the Black Panthers, and he spent 19 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, was acquitted, released, and so on. And he said that when he came back to his neighborhood, this, even though there was a high level of employment when he left, there was a lot of discussion and organizing that took place in those spaces. But when he came back, what he found was that people, uh, not only had those spaces been um, destroyed, but there was so much uh, influx of drugs, for example, right, that you know, it made it impossible to organize. And now we know, for example, very well documented. In fact, the journalist who first documented just passed away. It comes out very clear that the CIA was deliberately funneling drugs, crack cocaine, into black organizations, right? And it wasn't done simply as, as, uh, as part of the Iran Contra. It was done specifically as a form of social control. There's a very good book called Pipe, Pipe Dreams, okay, that deals with these issues. So that's one thing about social control. The other issue as well is, an, uh, is that many, um, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to use United as an example, but it's a very good book by Robert Allen called Black Awakening in Capitalist America. There's a Fari Hutchinson book. That also the, the U.S. state encouraged a class stratification in the black community to create a divergence in terms of material interest between one section and another section. Right? So Pan-Africanism, which has its various forms, Dr. Jeffers mentioned cultural national and Pan-Africanism. Some people have a conception of Pan-Africanism that's very capitalist oriented. Some people have a conception of Pan-Africanism very socialist oriented. Right? So there's also that issue of class. And so Michael Cabral, who I had a picture of him at the beginning, um, one of the great African theorists, one of the great African thinkers, one of the great African liberation right, um, leaders who led the liberation struggle in, uh, in Guinea Bissau and Cape Verde and was assassinated by the Portuguese in 1973. He also brought a, a class analysis for him, a class analysis, uh, a pan Africanism that didn't include a class analysis which put working people and poor people in the center was not a pan Africanism. Some people may disagree with that. So I think that's one of the particular issues that we can talk about. When we look outside of the United States, for example, um, you know, all of these, um, like everybody who attempted a Pan-African movement from Lumumba was assassinated, and Krumah was overthrown. Uh, um, Thomas Sankara and Burkina Faso overthrown and killed and assassinated, right? Uh, uh, countries that had first articulated a Pan-African view. I just finished a paper uh, on what's called a tri-continental conference, which spoke about this kind of unity among oppressed peoples. And one of the things, all of these countries were under siege from the very beginning. Right? So even though they had articulated a pan-Africanism, like the Algerian Revolution, for example, the kind of imperial siege they faced and the sabotage they faced destroyed those kind of dreams. And then what we have is the creation of comparable classes that have been co-opted by the Western imperialism. I know this is a highly unsatisfactory answer, but I often sit back and say, well, how the hell did these guys organize without internet? Okay? How did they print all this stuff without Facebook, right? And social media, right? Why were they so united around a particular cause? And of course they didn't succeed, but at least for a brief period of time there was this unity. And I think it has a lot to do with the state's conscious and deliberate act. Not only to destroy these organizations, but to ensure the conditions that led to them cannot be replicated. Uh, I think what I will add is to uh, say that the internet does do a lot, and uh, what I mean by that is that you have 
um, various kinds of unity, right? And some of what you might like to see, you know, is uh, is the kind of very organized unity where there's a political program and there's a sense of how to, you know, what action needs to be carried out. And, and these are the kinds of things that, that you might like to see that are lacking. Um, but I think those things are hard in general to know, you know, what is going to function when in terms of things of that nature. Uh, and in the meanwhile, it shouldn't be dismissed how much things like internet, social media connects people, familiarizes people with things. I mean, you know, uh, just in terms of like memes and jokes that people see, right, on Facebook, it's a very Pan-African world that you have of stuff that's circulating, you know, from the man's not hot guy in Britain to, you know, <laughs> the, you know, uh, this this uh, Kansime, this Ugandan woman who's very funny, and there's all kinds of things that people are exposed to now, right? And um, I think that things like that lay a sort of groundwork. It's not. It's not the real organized activity that you would like to see that has a real clear point and purpose, but it's a groundwork that something like that could build on. Yeah. And we could just possibly be living at a low point in the struggle. I mean, we can't forget Black Lives Matter. I mean, that had a significant impact on the ground, okay, and, trans and transform things. So perhaps we're living at, a, this is sort of like a, 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 the eye, the calm before the storm breaks. Mm -hmm. The revolutionary storms will flee. Great, thank you. Any other questions? And I'm mobile, so if you need the, the microphone. Do you need the microphone? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Maybe, yeah. Maybe not. Oh, okay, so th thank you so much. This is a really interesting and, and very rich uh, discussion, so I really appreciate that. Um, I, I'd like to, I guess, open up a discussion about how we manifest Pan-African identity while also accounting for the fact that within our communities there are hierarchies, right? There are people that are marginalized in every community, um, whether that's because of their gender, because of their sexuality, because of their ability, we can go down the list. How do we account for that while articulating unity at the same time? Yeah, well, I think it's, um, I think unfair dismissals of pan sometimes assume. Your mic's. Oh, okay. Better. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes, I think unfair dismissals of Pan-Africanism sometimes assume that Pan-Africanism can't do that, or that it's bound to mess that up, right? And so, I think it's important to make the different, make the distinctions between. You know, yeah, there are versions of uh, Pan-Africanism, especially cultural Pan-Africanism, that are, you know, highly patriarchal, or, you know, highly homophobic, you know, and so on and so on and so on, right? But I just, yeah, it, it, uh, that should, should never be naturalized, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, even though some of them weren't named, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 Professor Saini had some important women up there, right? Yeah. I saw Asada, yep. Asada Shakur, was that, was that Queen uh, Mother? Queen Mother Moore. Yeah, Queen Mother Moore uh, was up there. And then with, when you talk about Marcus Garvey, you really also have to talk about the Amy's, Amy, right? Amy Ashley Garvey, uh, Amy Jacques Garvey. All right, so there's, you know, always a, um, a history that can be told, you know, about the way that those who are often marginalized have still been working, shaping Pan-Africanism culturally, politically, right? Um, and uh, when we take account of that, um, we put ourselves in the position to kind of do it better. So those, those marginalized folks were never missing, but we can work towards stopping the marginalization itself, right, as we move forward, that to me is what Pan-Africanism should be. And I, I agree with what uh, Chico said. I also mentioned a uh, person uh, who should have been up there was Claudia Jones, 
Claudio Jones, uh, trained up with Dylan Cheney. Another Cheney. Went uh, in, back in uh, sort of like a bias. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so she, you know, she did all the work in Britain and she was an important thinker. Um, she was a communist, but she was an important thinker. And I think what Chiki was saying, like, you know, Pan Africanism, right, as an emancipatory project, has to encompass challenging these hierarchies, right? And as I said before, people, you know, some people have engaged in having these very hierarchical and uh, very. Um, shall we say, exclusive conceptions of Pan-Africanism. I think the issue when it comes to the imperative of unity and the imperative of liberation, right? Uh, I think, you know, you know yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a working progress, it's a living tree, okay? And that's why, for example, you have some <coughs> Pan-Africanists, for example, like the All, All African People's Revolutionary Party. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I know people in it, I'm not a member of it, but I know people in it, and they are Pan-Africans, right? And they think Pan-Africanism cannot be conceived of without being socialist. And it cannot be conceived of, of being socialist if it doesn't challenge all forms of oppression and discrimination, right? And I think that's critically, critically important. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so since you're closer to me. <laughs> no, uh, just a comment on, uh, uh, or maybe a question um, for the panelists. On this particular issue, I'm wondering if we're conflating unity with um, equality uh, in the sense that we might need to get unified around an agenda to fight oppression, but even within that struggle, there is, you know, there are natural hierarchies whether or not we, we, want, to, we want to deconstruct that or not. Uh, for example, um, you know, if there's a strike, if there's a faculty strike, and you guys are faculty members, right, you are indeed fighting around maybe um, conditions of work, uh, better, better wages, but yet, you know, within, within that, that structure, you have full professors, associate professors, and so on. So I'm just wondering whether or not um, we might be completing the issue of um, unity around fighting the cause with equality. Um, I'm, just, I'm just asking another question. Yeah. What, what, what would you see as a natural hierarchy? I mean, like, I mean, I don't like the distinction between full and associate professor and all these different things. It might seem natural to some people, it might not seem natural to others, right? right. Yes, yeah, so that's what do you mean as a natural? No, what I mean as a natural, well, for example, if you think of the struggles that were led by churches, for example, yeah. there was a hierarchy there. Was a hierarchy. Even though, um, you, you know, the church was a rallying place for, to bring people together to fight oppression, yet still, yeah, the pastors and so on, the deacons, there was a hierarchy there. So I, I'm just wondering whether or not you can, so, so there is the issue of, you know, trying to, to create unity amongst the people versus equality within that people, those people itself. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that once we remove the word natural, we, we, we may all agree <laughs> okay, sure. on this. Yeah, I, I mean, all right. Because, you know, the church example, again, is a certain kind of socially constructed hierarchy. And as you say, uh, you know, you could might you could want to deconstruct it or you could not. Maybe you think that you know uh, the, the black Panther, way, the Black Panthers had a hierarchy, right? You may right, and so maybe some of these organizational hierarchies they help. Maybe some, maybe some they don't. Right? There there would be questions there. And I also uh, maybe in line with what you're saying, like I don't conflate Pan Africanism with, for example, all of the things that I want to see get better. Right? I mean, you know, and, and I do think that there can be that issue. This, I think this happens with feminism as well, you know, where, 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 where uh, people would like to identify the movement that they're, that they're working with, right, as, as um, you know, as, as getting rid of every bad thing that they want to see. And thus they, wouldn't, they would like to define those who are against that, right, as not really belonging to it, right? I, 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 in terms of you know uh, me being invested in pan Africanism, again I say that that you know that there are different kinds of pan Africanism and some would have certain politics that I wouldn't agree with, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we would be sharing exactly as you say that goal of unity, right? And but then it does become tough questions of when you can compromise <coughs> and when you can't, right? On certain matters of principle. You know, when you can push an issue off for unity for this meeting versus you have to have a, the, the discussion, right? Like so, so you so you get into tough issues at that point. Professor Saini, did you want to respond or? Uh, I, I just, um, I don't know, I mean, in terms of, um, 
I mean, in, in, in terms of uh, hierarchies, I mean, I know there's organizational hierarchies. I mean, we look at, for example, uh, African liberation struggles. They had to be organized. But also there's the idea, but hopefully there was the argument, at least in lip service in some of these uh, things, to the issue that, yes, we have hierarchies in terms of decision making, but we also have democratic means, right, by which, you know, those hierarchies can be, you know, replenished and, you know, people don't o occupy those positions internally. And so, so, I mean, this, but as, as um, Chiki <coughs> pointed out, there's various interpretations of Pan-Africanism. So, for example, I identify myself as a Pan-Africanist, but I guess I'd be a Pan-Africanist socialist, right? Okay, such as Walter Rodney, right, who saw himself as a Pan African socialist, such as um, Kwame Ture, who was the uh, Stokely Carmichael Pan African socialist, and so and that encompasses the fact that you do need organization to run society, but you have to have a prof profound democratic accountability as well. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Annette, and uh, I don't think it's too much of a question. I think it would be like more of a proposal. Why don't we change the way? we look at Pan-Africanism. I feel like we miss a gap between the, those who are educated and understand such terminologies, and those who are illiterate, but they deserve to have such information. All of us here speak the same language, but I cannot tell you the meaning of Pan-Africanism in my mother tongue. I don't know what it means. So we are all speaking the same language in the, in the academia world, but we ignore a larger group that deserves it. Such. So why don't we try? It's in Uganda. I'm from Uganda. So why don't we try to to kind of pull down the pressure from the academic world and let knowledge flow downwards? How do you tell a mother to socialize their children to let them know that before you are a Nigerian, before you are a Kenyan, true you feel differently, you dress differently, but you are an African, and this is what you should respect and observe, because most of us are now bleaching to make sure we fit in a world we don't understand. Yeah. I'm neither black nor white. <laughs> what does that mean? Because I don't understand from my mother's language. I've only known about it because I'm highly educated. Well, I, I, think, I think you raise a very, very important <coughs> question, right? And as you, was, as you was making your question, I was thinking about Amarico Cabral, very highly educated person. And who, when he was carrying on the liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau, and he was training cadres, right, to go and work there, one of the important points was having them being able to relate, not in a paternalistic fashion, but to the peasants, right, really to people who were farmers, the ordinary folks, and so on. And he's always said that, you know, don't, don't confuse, you know, the ideas in your head with reality, okay? And he often said, remember, people aren't fighting for ideas in your head, they're fighting for concrete transformation in their lives. And so he had a big focus on education, right? But education that was in the service of the people and basically wasn't imposed on them. These become very difficult processes, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we all want immediate change. We all would like the world to be transformed, transformed in a blink of an eye. But sometimes certain things take time, right? And I think one, one of the biggest issues, especially for the intelligentsia, right? Again, Cabral at one point said, because the intelligentsia tended to come from the middle class or the petty bourgeoisie, that they had to commit class suicide, okay, by basically folding back in and collapsing or falling back in uh, to the masses, right, if I may use that term. And so this becomes, a, this becomes a very important question. So, for example, they emphasize people speaking in the local tongues and the local languages. Uh, <coughs> setting up committees in liberated areas from Portuguese control, you would emphasize, for example, that you know, you'd have a, the committee, the way we set up in a liberated territory, if I remember correctly, was there'd be five elected people, and two of those had to be women. You could actually have five elected women, but two of them were definitely reserved for women. So a lot of this stuff, learning the local language, uh, working with uh, customs, and becoming one with the people, right? Difficult thing, sounds pretty um, uh, corny, <laughs> like, you know, typical rhetoric of every revolutionary, right? But Cabral, at least before he was assassinated, and what was able to be done in liberation territories in Guinea-Bissau, have been used as an example by many people what can be achieved, right? The issue of transforming the ideas that, you know, the, uh, like Dr. Jeffers and others have articulated, and, you know, me as a, a, myself as a historian, to make them accessible to people who are dealing with bread and butter issues, right? Mm -hmm. To make it accessible to people who have not been exposed and are perhaps exposed to the distortions of Western education that we have is always very difficult. And I think this is one of the, 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 the huge um, challenges that we all face. Um, my, 
my daughter asked me when um, earlier today, you know, what are you going to go do at Dalhousie today? Mm -hmm. Right, and I said, um, uh, you know, that I'm going to um, talk about uh, why it's nice to be of African descent. <laughs> You know, I mean, and, and, that, and she understood that, right? I said, do you like being of African descent? She said, yes, because uh, I think people in Africa wear things that are cool. And so, <laughs> so she's, you know, seven, right? You know, so this is the conversation, right? Just a conversation like that. So there's different levels that we break it down at, right? You know, depending on the conversation. And I think, and I, and you know, call this uh, overly optimistic, but I think that any language you could have, you know, a real discussion about what Pan-Africanism is. There was, you know, certainly a time when to have the discussion, you know, in Luganda wouldn't make sense because, you know, Africa wasn't a thing to, you know, that kingdom at one point, right? You know, they knew of the peoples near them, certain other Bantu peoples, certain Nilata peoples, and so on. But the, you know, this Africa thing is a construct that colonialism, colonialism makes them African, right? But now, I'm sure there's a word for African in Uganda. <laughs> and, and, and a word for black people, because I mean, you know, uh, every, I think really every language had to have some language for the white people, right? So who were coming around and like, you know, choosing, you know, choosing who's going to be the new chief and, and things of this nature, right? So, it's, so there's, there's always a story that can be told there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just how we, how we choose to tell it, how we choose to explain it. All right, so we have a question over here. Thank you very much for your presentation. The historical piece was quite amazing, and the philosophical argument of both sides really made me think of how we need to critically think about culture. And the question she asked, and the way you answered it, it's in line with what I was going to ask. I'm a student of social linguistics, and I know uh, language can be used to the advantage of the person who wants to use it. And imperialism created the concept of race for their own benefit. And you did mention about uh, uh, emancipating our, our mind, like decolonizing our mind. And as someone from the continent who has chosen Nova Scotia to be their home, and someone who has experienced the difference. I was a school teacher here at public school, and my experience was quite uh, devastating that I can't even speak about. But it was around the culture piece. And the question you asked about equality made me really think about the term unity doesn't necessarily mean same or constant. And we can't have a culture that is the same because culture evolves. So as people from the continent and uh, the African in the diaspora, how else can we really, how, how, like, do you have any suggestion on how to continue this conversation that there is benefit for us to see ourselves as having some commonality? Because you mentioned very clearly that our culture is not biologically defined, neither is it specially defined. I'm Kenyan. And so someone will think I have a Kenyan culture, but there's this talk of Africa. So is there some simple concept that can really start the conversation within Nova Scotia where we can really see the value of an Africanism and see the value of having unity without having to be the same? I think the thing I'll say to begin with is that uh, you can't, I don't think you can really effectively do it uh, without some sense of history. Now, how complicated you go into the history, you know, how how um, you know how you package the history is a, is a question. But you know, it's 
if someone doesn't automatically see it, right? Some people, you know, for whatever, you know, they, they, they say they feel it, right? You know, oh, I see another black person, I just know that we are connected, right? You know, but if you have someone who says the opposite, who says, what do I have to do with these other black people, right? I don't think you can really show them the point unless they're willing to think about how we got from this time when we didn't even know we were Africans, right, to now, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I don't know if that counts as simple, but I do think helping people understand the history, right, and how, um, how we ended up where we are, I do think that is key. Uh, but I also do think that it's important to tell the story in a way that it's, um, it includes the forms of victimization that, that slavery and colonialism are, but it also includes, you know, the agency. Uh, I don't know if that counts as too un unsimple, you know, a word, but like the, the, the uh, you know, the activity, the ways in which we have reshaped the categories that we were given, right? We, you know, as you mentioned, races in some sense, or what race in some sense originates with oppressive ethics, right? But when I say that I'm proud to be black, I'm not saying I like being oppressed. I'm saying that there's a history of people who were being oppressed that fought back against that oppression, you know, that created beauty in the midst of that oppression, right? And I identify with that, and I think that that's something worth being proud of and, and, and identifying with. And so, and so again, either way, I think that, that some sense of history is important too. Um, I just gonna ask very quickly because when the experience I'm talking about, the teacher told me you don't understand the history, mm. and so my question was around what can welcome the conversation of me wanting to know the history of someone who was born here and then wanting to know my history and find that common. Mm -hmm. Like what can welcome that kind of conversation? Mm -hmm. well, I just think of it as I think uh, we have to create the spaces for that yes. discussion and that dialogue. So and being a Pan African can be both easy because it's almost an intuitive position. It can be extremely difficult because of the um, the issues that Chike has outlined, Dr. Ch Jefferson has outlined. So for example, I'm working on a project, uh, and some others, about looking at African Nova Scotian history. Right? So I have roots in the African Nova Scotian community, and I have roots in the Caribbean. And my project is basically to look at and make the argument, which I believe I can make strong, that African Nova Scotians constitute a distinct people, and perhaps even a quasi-nation. But how do I reconcile that distinctiveness with Pan-Africanism? with being a Pan-Africanism. So uh, as I said before, I don't think um, uh, being a Pan-African implies a homogeneity and amorphous kind of identity, right? But one of the issues is also to see that sometimes this history of where these tensions come from is very important to understand as well. So for example, you know, the, uh, the, Af the black Nova Scotian population, whether we call it indigenous black, historical black, or George's comment uh, uh, term, term Africanian, right? They have a specific history here. And the state has been able to sometimes use buffers, right? To manipulate <coughs> new incoming groups, right? To create these tensions between them, right? <coughs> so what we need is to have this kind of dialogue, right? So for example, the term indigenous black, right? Which ha was a term that emerged not to claim um, any indigeneity of the Mi'kmaq, even though there's a strong historical relationship between the black Nova Scotia community and the Mi'kmaq nation, was basically to, um, to, to basically identify that in Nova Scotia, there is a distinct black population whose history was increasingly being marginalized and pushed to the side by what it meant to be black Canadian, by the by, by emergent dialogue that was coming out of Toronto. Okay? So that created a tension. And Rocky, for example, was one of the people who tried to mediate that tension by saying, let's have dialogue, let's not have this tension. So I think, as Chike was, um, as Dr. Jeffers was pointing out, okay, what's important here is that one of the issues with the state, and of course with white supremacy, is how it finds ways, in various ways, either deliberately or, or, or non-deliberately, um, indirectly or indirectly, to create these tensions and this discord among us, right? We have to find ways to have our own dialogue, right? So every one of us here, and it's obviously we're cognizant 
of the fact that there are tensions between new incoming people of African descent and the historical community. So those contradictions exist, but they should not be antagonistic contradictions. They can be resolved through dialogue by recognizing that there has been a historical community here okay, that has faced a particular history of marginalization, oppression, and super exploitation. Okay? And for example, the reason, for example, they don't have the educational success has nothing to do with certain inherent uh, qualities, culture, but it has to do with a particular history of oppression. So for example, you know, I had the, the ex I had the, not the pleasure, but I had the, um, I don't even say good fortune, I had the, I, I had the ex experience of having d done my entire education, except for one semester, in Trinidad and Tobago, under a British system, right? You know, and having done a semester here with my cousins, right? And the difference in the experience, right, really brought it home to me. What it means to live in, in a different spot, like Trinidad and Tobago, where everybody's black, where, where the idea of black inferiority, right? Where racism manifests itself differently. There's no concept of black inferiority, right? But to be here in Nova Scotia and to have to ha have sort of an insight and that kind of experience was also very interesting, was, was very education, educating, right, in that sense, right? So I think one of the important points is when, when people come to a part of the world, I mean, I'm not trying to put uh, onus on, but I think it's important to know about the history of the place you're coming to, right? And I think we need to create those spaces and dialogue to say, here is a long standing, and you know, as they say in Scotia, we've been here, right? Okay? So, a long, uh, to have that dialogue, the discussion. Here's the history of this community. This is what they've gone through. This is a province in which history is deeply rooted. May not, not on the scale of the United States, may not have the economic strategic significance as in the United States, but it was an institution that left deep imprint on the society, right? And people who came afterwards as immigrants, even though they might be le um, legally free, normally free, like the black rollers and the black refugees who came in the, um, um, the 1780s and then the after war, they, they came to a society that was a slave society, and that had a tremendous imprint on them, right? And so we need to know this history, as Dr. Jefferson has pointed out, right? And I think we need to create these spaces for this dialogue this exchange. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we're almost out of time, but we have one question. Well, we have two questions, but I think I should probably, looking at Ronke, is it okay to take the questions or you want to say thank you? Is everyone okay to stay for two more questions or we're good for that? Okay, great. So we have two final questions and then we'll say our thank yous and then we'll thank the panelists. One second. Uh, so thank you for the presentations and for taking us down the, hit for the history, giving us the history. Um, I think it's important we're talking about, about Pan-Africanism. So my question is, having had a conversation and discussion here today, how do we create that space and environment that you are talking about, not only internally about with those of us who are in this room who are interested, but out externally? Um, within the context of our institutions, within the context of our community, within the context of our local <coughs> regional organizations. Um, so how do we go about creating that space, given that we are in 2018? We know that the challenges that we face, we know when we talk about unity, unity means different things to different people. We know the inequity that is being faced, challenging there, so as a people and as a community, how do we create that space and that environment? Um, it, it's funny that uh, Bernadette has just stood up. Oh. No, no, I'm sorry. I don't mean to let you feel shame. As I was listening to your question, I was thinking um, about uh, Bernadette read over here because I think there are people that I see in the community who make it look easy. And I think that Bernadette is an example of that, right? Someone who uh, you will find at all the black events and that really means all the black events because sometimes all the black events means just the ones for the people who are from here. Sometimes all the black events means just the ones that are mainly African immigrants, right? Bernadette, you'll find that all of them, right? <laughs> and, you know, so, so um, it's, a, it's a sort of a simple answer, but I feel like role models matter, and so that's 
the stab that I will take it at him because yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd add Lynn Jones to that as well. Yes. Um, she is a person who lives the struggle for Africa and Nova Scotians, but also lives the struggle for Pan-Africanism. I think perhaps you know we need to be. I, I, when, you, when you asked the question, I was thinking of Walter Rodney, right? And I was thinking back to the question of breaking down the divide between the so-called the edu highly educated and those who, you know, who are not as educated, right? And uh, Walter Rodney, um, I mentioned how Europe and developed Africa, but there's another publication which was Groundings with My Brothers, right? Which was when he was in Jamaica, he went into the ghettos, he went into these um, in, uh, into these areas, right? And lectured to them, but also sat down and reasoned with them, right? Okay, that's like what we mean by reason is people sit down and have discussions. And so one of the things I think is we, the idea of the organic intellectual, the idea of people going into the community, establishing these dialogues, right? And I think, you know, we can do that. And I, and I think when people sit down, right, we understand there's much more in common if they say that, right? And separate. That's not to say that everybody has to be homogenized. But I think these dialogues become very, very, very important. And it means actually um, going into the spaces we normally don't go, going outside of academy going outside of the community centers, going into these places, and perhaps even when new immigrants come in from Africa, right, from other places, you know, sitting down with them and saying, listen, so taking them to the community. So another person who does this stuff is Bob Hamilton Hinch. Okay, she will take people who come in here uh, when she was, um, and take them off, and I know Ronky does it with the tour of Preston's as well. People go off to these places, right? So people go off to see the community. And to the issue, here's a unique community, but at the same time, you're also part of this broader family, right? So I think we, can, we need to consciously perhaps create dialogue centers or dialogue um, uh, locations where we can go and have these uh, conversations. And one point, which is not linked to this, which I want to mention before we go, when it came to this issue of the imperative, right, of African unity, and this goes back to Africa, is, you know, sometimes it comes down to the idea, I believe in it, but sometimes it comes down to the concrete need just to be united to struggle against imperialism. And one of the things that's emerged, which is, which is frightening me, is at one stage the idea of population control, right? Okay, the idea that there were too many one people was a debate that had been shifted to the marginal sites, right? It's now becoming mainstream again. Mm -hmm. And apart from the idea that last year in the Global Mail, in April of 2017, there was a front page article which led into a huge center spread piece by Jeffrey York, which said that Africa has too many people and it's a threat. He actually said it's a threat. Uh, to, the, to, the, to the future of this planet, right? So once again, we see the idea of Africans being surplus. Africans somehow, um, uh, not only being a surplus population, but Africans, Africa's population has to be called, is surfacing again, this kind of genocidal thought. And I think something like that, regardless of what, what, what country you come from in Africa, what ethnic group or nationality, the fact that Africa has been targeted as a whole for this kind of, of what I can only call a genocidal assault, right, necessarily demands that we must unite. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have one more question, okay. and then you can move. It's really just adding that part, I think part of the problem is I have two children in the school system, and one thing is um, Black History Month is in February one month every year, you know? It's not really taught to the kids in a yearly basis. We don't have a larger platform for our children in school. It is really up to the parents to teach your children about their history. Because they come home and they say, well, this is what we learned at school. And you're like, actually, this is what it is. Because what they're teaching them at school is colonialism history. It's not actually history. It's what they want people to think is the history. So I think that's the larger problem. That's the problem right now of people who are coming in from Africa and learning the history from here. You have to learn it on your own. You can't go into the school system and learn it there. You have to be able to question what you're learning in the school system and go out and get the actual history from all different sources, you know. <laughs> Any comments or responses? No, I just think that's a, a comment. I mean, the problem is that often um, the history we're taught in this school at the very least ignores and erases black history or at the very most is incredibly racist. And we have that not only in the public school system, we have examples of that at university as well. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you so much to everyone for staying the extra few minutes. We're just about to be wrapping up, and I'd also like to say thank you to the panelists, if we could give them a hand.
for continuing to come out and support the black events at Dow. We really appreciate it. So it's great to see such a full crowd. Have a good night. Or Ron is going to come up for a sec. I just want to thank everybody for coming out again tonight. Um, and I especially want to thank Dr. Abby Miller for giving up his time to um, live stream this event. Um, thank you for our panelists. Um, they are my <laughs> special people that I run to when I need to. Um, so I'm just going to announce to you our next event. Um, we are in commemoration of the elimination of racial discrimination. Um, it's coming up Tuesday, March 20th in room 307, sub here. And the title will be Activism in Words and Songs. So I hope that we'll come out again when it's time and to join us to listen to um, people who will talk about um, the artist will use the act of music and words to challenge racism. Um, thank you very much for coming out again and um, have a good night. <laughs>